We shall now begin with the day's proceedings. The first on the agenda is a keynote address by Dr. Donald Ingber. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here in person or uh, live on talk because the, the times are very different. And so um, we have his recorded talk. However, we do have Dr. Girija Goel, one of his lab members in the audience, and she will be very happy to take up questions. So if you have them, please save them for the end of the talk. Dr. Donald Ingber is the founding director of the WISE Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University, the Judah Folkman Professor for Vascular Biology at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital, and Professor of Engineering at Harvard John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. He received his PhD from Yale University. Currently, Dr. Ingbert leads a scientific and engineering team across a broad range of disciplines to develop breakthrough technologies that advance healthcare with more than 500 publications and 165 patents to his name, Dr. Ingber has helped break down boundaries between science, art, and design. He was named one of the top 20 translational researchers worldwide in 2012 and 2020, a leading global thinker of 2015, and has received numerous other honors in a broad range of disciplines. He developed human organs on chip lined by human, living human cells that are being used to replace animal testing for drug development and personalized medicine. This technology was named one of the top 10 emerging technologies by the World Economic Forum and Design of the Year by the London Design Museum and was also acquired by the Museum of Modern Art in New York City for its permanent design collection. His talk today, will focus on human organs on chip for disease modeling, drug development, and personalized medicine. And to show you how the level of clinical mimicry that we're able to obtain in these preclinical models. Now, uh, for the last 38 years, I've been a professor at Harvard University. Um, but for the last 13, I'm, I've been the founding director of the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. Uh, this started based on the challenge to envision the future of bioengineering 30 years ahead and to really transform this across Harvard and its affiliated hospitals. And what we realized in thinking about this is that looking backwards, engineering has transformed medicine and industry by taking engineering principles and solve, trying to solve major problems. And we have hip implants and pacemakers and drug delivery systems and stents and so forth, it has been truly transformative. But thinking forward and looking around, we realize that the boundaries between all the scientific disciplines are, are, have really broken down and that we've uncovered enough about how nature builds, controls and manufactures from the nanoscale up that we realize that we're at a point where we could leverage biological principles to develop new engineering innovations. And this is what we call biologically inspired engineering. And we were kickstarted with what was then the single largest gift in Harvard's history from Hans Jörg Wies of $125 million. Uh, but we were challenged with taking on really high risk, but potentially huge impact uh, problems and challenges. And the biggest problem that I could see at that time was that the drug development model is is basically broken. It costs billions of dollars to go from a discovery at the bench to approval by the FDA or a regulatory agency in Europe. Uh, there are many reasons for this. A major one is that you have to do animal studies. They take years to complete. They're major ethical issues. But um, they're also, uh, the real problem is that 70% of the time, and in some areas, 95% of the time, the results from animals don't predict what you see in human clinical trials. And so as a result, there's been a search to find alternative approaches, alternative preclinical models that are human relevant and maybe could help us develop safer and more effective drugs faster and at lower cost. And so when we started the Institute, we had five major areas and I headed one myself that focused on what has become known as human organs on chips. And the basic idea is, that, is to leverage computer microchip manufacturing technology that, that fabricates structures with features at the same nanometer to micrometer scale that living cells and tissues live at to create 
devices that contain living human cells that reconstitute organ level functions, not cellular tissue, but organ level functions to accelerate drug development, replace animal testing and advance personalized medicine. And our first breakthrough we call the human breathing lung on a chip. These are, we're not trying to build the three dimensional organ. We're trying to build a, what I like to think of as a living three dimensional cross section through a major functional unit of a, of a human organ. In this case, the air sac or alveolus, and as you know, this is where we have gas exchange, aerosol-based drug delivery, uh, viral infections, um, metastasis, et cetera. And the next slide shows you how this works. At the top right, it's the size of a computer memory stick. It's optically clear, made out of a flexible rubber. If you cut it in cross-section, there are three hollow channels, each less than a millimeter wide. The middle one is cut into top and bottom by a very thin, clear a silicon rubber memory with pores. We coat it with extracellular matrix. To make the lung chip, we have human lung alveolar cells, human lung capillary cells. We just recreated the alveolar capillary interface. And then the trick is that we have cyclic suction applied to these side chambers. Everything's flexible. And now it stretches and relaxes at the same rate and degree as when we breathe. We can now put air over the top for an air liquid interface. And we could have uh, medium with or without immune cells or even whole blood for short times if we have endothelial cells on all four sides as we do now. So if this were to work, it should be able to replicate organ level response. So imagine if you have a bacterial infection like pneumonia, there's normally a tissue tissue signaling response, epithelium put out cytokines that activate the endothelium to express receptors like ICAM, white blood cells that just were normally flowing by now stick, roll, diapodes or migrate across and engulf. Now I'm gonna show you imaging in the real device. What you see uh, now are white blood cells that are labeled fluorescently white, you can't see the endothelium, it's black. The epithelium is behind the screen. To begin with, quiescent blood vessel, they just flow by. We put bacteria or cytokines on the other side, they, they get activated, and now you'll see them being pulled out under flow. And this is important because the initial adhesion event is sh shear stress dependent in vivo. Now we can do any imaging that you can in vitro or in vivo in these devices. So I'll show you a higher magnification. Here's one white blood cell. It's gonna find a space between two endothelium that are unlabeled there, goes underneath, finds the matrix filled pores, migrates through wiggling its rear end out of focus. Now you're gonna see it come out by phase contrast on the epithelial side. And now I'm gonna show you the white blood cells in red because of the bacteria are labeled with GFP in green and you watch them being engulfed. So you just watch the entire human inflammatory response in the lung microenvironment in this little chip. So we got a lot of interest. Uh, but pharmaceutical companies came to us. They said, this is really great, but you know we're more interested in disease models. That's where animal models really fail. And also uh, drug toxicity was of great interest. So we had two birds with one stone by developing a model of pulmonary edema, fluid on the lungs, by perfusing the approved cancer drug interleukin-2 through the vascular channel, just like an IV infusion. And in patients, it's dose limiting toxicity is pulmonary vascular leakage leading to edema. In the chip, day zero before drug, you, from above with air, this is what it looks like. The bottom, you see over two to four days, you get a meniscus of fluid filling the airspace that completely fills it. This is this exact same time course with the same dose where this has been seen in humans. We could quantify this using a trick from respiratory physiology, using fluorescent inulin to look at fluid shifts. And what you can see in the blue is what I just showed you, but that is with physiological breathing motions. If we have no breathing motions, or we do this in a static trans well with the same tissue tissue interface, we've, we see minimal effect. Now, um, we, we then carried this out uh, in vivo in a, in a mouse, ex vivo ventilation perfusion model where we can control blood flow separately from breathing and we saw exactly the same thing. And this is something that was never seen before. It wasn't a prediction. It wasn't a you know, mimicry, it was a prediction which we confirmed. Now, I've worked in the field of mechanobiology since 1970s uh, and it's something that I really have helped to, to, to pioneer with the idea that Mechanical forces may be as important as chemicals and genes. This is a great example of it. But because I've worked on it so long, we actually had identified one of the earliest mechanotransduction events, which is when you stretch the matrix, forces go through integrin receptors, and in the focal adhesion, there's an ion channel called trip V4 
that senses the force and lets calcium in in five milliseconds. And that's upstream from many integrin and mechanochemical signaling responses. So GlaxoSmithKline, I knew, was working on an inhibitor of that channel. And we were able to get the, they didn't fund our work, but we get the drug from them. And we completely inhibited pulmonary edema in this IL-2 model. They then carried out result uh, studies in dogs and, and, uh, and, and rabbits with a cardiogenic pulmonary edema, back pressure induced pulmonary edema, got the same results. We had back-to-back -back papers in science translation medicine, and that drug is now in phase two clinical trials. Now, the reviewers of this paper said this should not be published, one reviewer, because uh, it's too simple, there's no immune cells. The other reviewers said, this is kind of amazing. This is synthetic biology at the cell, tissue, and organ level. They just showed you don't need immune cells for pulmonary edema induced by interleukin-2. This is something we've seen again and again and again. We can get insights into physiological and pathophysiological mechanisms and drug actions and toxicities that you could not get in any other way. So this one model, this lung alveolus chip, provided proof of principle for human disease model a drug toxicity model, I'm not showing here, but we have other models with chips where we've literally a, a, a biologic that had no toxicity in animals that, that caused major toxicity in phase one clinical trials, um, essentially due to pulmonary thrombosis, uh, we could mimic that in these chips. Uh, drug efficacy, therapeutic target discovery, uh, new drug discovery, this, this one is in clinical trials. And we've also delivered gene therapies on these chips, and that's all published. Um, we've also integrated immune cells, as I showed you, but we've also integrated uh, stromal fibroblasts and other types of cells into these chips as well. This has won multiple awards. I'm most uh, proud that it won the uh, International Design Award. We beat out a Frank Geary building and a Google car that year, uh, but it's literally in the Museum of Modern Art's uh, permanent design collection as well, which we're really proud of. So uh, that was one functional unit modeled. We then went on to the lung airway because multiple drug companies said that they're more interested in pulmonary edema, I, I'm sorry, in asthma and uh, chronic, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD as the drug targets, bigger population needs. So we basically took large airway epithelium, human, human lung endothelium, put them on these chips, you can see that three, day, three weeks at air liquid interface only perfusing through the vascular channel like in our bodies. You get beautiful differentiation, directional cilia motion at the bottom right. If you put fluorescent microparticles and measure mucociliary transport, the velocity is the same in it as in our lungs. That's a real time movie. We then made chips with cells from patients with COPD. And even after three weeks of differentiation on chip without immune cells, they retained the COPD phenotype. It must be epigenetic changes, but decreased TOL3 and TOL R3 and 4 receptors no, known to happen in patients as well. Now, what brings these patients to the emergency room are exacerbations, usually either by viral infection, bacterial infection, or cigarette smoke. And so here we mimicked viral infection with poly IC and bacterial infection with LPS endotoxin. And you can see indeed that healthy lung chips didn't really change with IL-8 secretion, major inflammatory cytokine, but COPD did. Same with MCSF. And one was sensitive to bacterial and the other one to viral. So it may be useful for diagnostics as well. And then we built a cigarette smoking robot. This is a Gatling gun with real cigarettes. That's a cigarette lighter from a car. Uh, this can control the puff intensity interval, pauses mimicking real smoking behavior. And real smoke goes right to the airspace of the chip, not cigarette extract as done in the past. And with that, as shown at the left, you can see that healthy lung chips, IL-8 does not change in response to cigarette smoke, but with COPD, you double this inflammatory cytokine levels and you know that is an exacerbation on chip. We then we now do multi-omics on these chips. We've done metabolomics, uh, proteomics, transcriptomics, glycomics. This is transcriptomics. The, the three lanes at the right are chips of healthy chips, the change in gene expression relative to uh, after cigarette exposure before relative to before. The nine at the left are from a clinical study of otherwise healthy people who smoke cigarettes. And we were really excited. The top quarter versus bottom three quarters look pretty much the same. But the reviewers, again, said, well, your chips are too similar. There's much greater variability in real populations. And then we realized 
that we can do this type of study better than a clinical study because this is matched comparative modeling of the same patient before and after the stimulus, in this case, smoke. And those changes are actually due to smoke exposure as opposed to different work history, family history, and work environment, et cetera. And this then got accepted as well. We just in the fall, late fall, published a paper where we made chips with airway cells from patients with cystic fibrosis. Uh, as you can see, along the whole length of the chip, there's much more cilia production in these chips, also known in patients. There, there's beating frequency is, is higher on chips, although you do not see that in trans walls with the same cells, same medium. Uh, there's more mucus production on chips as in patients. There's a higher baseline inflammatory state in terms of recruitment of immune cells and cytokine production. And we could even do mic microbiome studies in that Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a bacterium that's in our lungs, but is a major cause of morbidity and mortality in patients with COPD. And we see a greatly increased abundance growth of bacteria in these cystic fibrosis chips. Now, the important point of all this is that what it made us realize is that organ chips essentially provide a window on molecular scale activities inside living human cells within a relevant tissue and organ context. And so that this might be able to enable mechanistic insights as well as new drug discovery. And so um, just as one example, we were funded starting about four or five years ago by both DARPA and NIH to develop models of potential pandemic respiratory viruses. Now, the worry then was influenza. This is five years ago. Uh, and so we started with influenza. Turns out these are great models for this purpose. GFP virus infects the epithelium. You disrupt the, the junctions, ZO1, cilia. You even see endothelial cell damage that really hasn't been studied in the past. If you use different strains like H1N1, H3N2, H5N1, you see differences in virulence that match that in human. You could quantify barrier disruption. But more importantly, as opposed to cell lines in a dish, you can measure host responses to infections and drugs. So this is basically a cytokine storm of IL-6, IP-10, Rantus, and so forth, which the differences in response to different strains, again, scales with the virulence in, in humans. We could do immune cell recruitment and now watch the neutrophils migrate up to the epithelium and clear the virally infected cells. And now when we test drugs like Oseltamivir, also known as Tamiflu, lead drug for influenza, we get beautiful inhibition of viral infection. However, we, we give this at a clinically relevant dose and, and Cmax, and we only see effects if we give it within the first 48 hours after infection, which is precisely what the FDA has only approved its use for. Now, interestingly, we could even model evolution of virus, viral evolution and emergence of variants of concern using these chips. So this is a human lung chip. We infect with virus in the presence of a drug that is 90% effective. So there's still some viral replication. We then a couple of days later, take a drop of fluid, put it, pass it through the airspace and then move it to another chip treated the same way as if we were coughing and there was a respiratory droplet passing from lung to lung and do it again and again. With this, if we use the drug amantadine in eight passages, we got completely resistant viruses that when we genome sequenced, we identified all of the known mutations that have been found in patients, human patients who became resistant to this drug in the literature. But we also found mutations no one's ever seen before. So this could be used to discover uh, variants that will be coming down the pike in the future for drug development or vaccine development. By the way, we did this with uh, Tamiflu. It took 25 passages, but we got resistant organisms, which is a little terrifying. Now, this is where we were in January 2020 when COVID-19 hit. And I have two postdocs, Long Long Si and Hai Ching Bei, who are Chinese, who were following this on social media from their home. And the day after they published the sequence, gene sequence for SARS-CoV-2, they, they ordered a SARS-CoV-2 spike protein expressing pseudotyped virus because we only have a BSL-2 lab. And they started to do studies because it was an emergency to think, can they quickly repurpose existing drugs to be used for this disease? They looked at the literature, they came up with 30 drugs that had shown some activity against related viruses like first SARS, MERS, Ebola. And they quickly tested it in a cell line like they would have done in their old virology lab, HUH7, which 
they know viruses grow really well, and um, you know it's probably because it has decreased interferon response and doesn't have normal uh, you know receptors, but the, the viruses grow well there. So when they did that, out of the 30 drugs, they found eight shown here that gave a dose-dependent inhibition of viral entry um, in the low micromolar range. Notice hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine are here. This is February 2020. And then we decided to test them in our human chips. And the first thing we did is we made sure that they expressed the relevant receptor, ACE2, and the Tempras2 uh, protease modifying enzyme that's important for entry, and they do at very high levels. And now we test them by flowing them through the chip at a clinically relevant blood CMAX has previously reported in patients. And now hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine have absolutely no inhibition, nor do three drugs that failed in clinical trials for this. But we found that there were three drugs that had some significant effects with amlodiaquine, a related anti-malarial being most potent. And long story short, we got funding from DARPA to collaborate with Ben Tenover at Mount Sinai and Matt Freeman at Maryland and we could show that amodiaquine in a hamster model of COVID-19 gave significant inhibition if you treat prophylactically one day before. Hydroxychloroquine, no effect, which has been confirmed again and again by others. This is the histology showing significant suppression in lung. If we give it to an animal and then we put an infected animal in a cage, we have 90% inhibition of transmission from patient to patient, if you like. And if we give it one day afterwards in a treatment mode, we have sustained suppression as well. And based in part on these results, this drug is now in clinical trials for COVID across 20 sites in Africa. Now, more recently, we, we extended this to work on our lung alveolus chips using our influenza model. This was accepted for Nature Communications yesterday. Um, and we used H3N2, which produces a pneumonia-like uh, phenotype and can be deadly, um, more like COVID. Um, and what we found is that uh, there's major cytokine production uh, across the board. We did RNA-seq and major uh, interferon response to you know, fight off the virus. Um, but uh, what really interesting is that we found that if we have physiological breathing motions or take them away and do it statically, that physiological breathing motions suppress infection significantly. The, the titers are down by about 75%. And this also suppresses the cytokine storm, if you like. So somehow physiological breathing motions are critical for protecting us against viral infection. Looking into this further, we found that 5% strain, deformation, of breathing motions for two weeks gave you potent induction of multiple type 1 and 3 interferons uh, genes, whereas if you do the same study with the same cells in a trans wall, statically, no in increase. And the gene that caught us the, uh, our attention, the highest expressor was called S100A7, which is not expressed in static trans walls. This was also expressed at the protein level. And why it was interesting is that um, th this mediated induction of the the antiviral interferon, so it was critical path, but more importantly, S100A7 binds the receptor for advanced glycation end products, RAGE, which is most highly expressed in the alveolar cells in human lung. Uh, and it's involved in many inflammatory responses across the body. And we were able to obtain a drug called Azilorigan, which is a RAGE inhibitor drug, which was in phase three clinical trials at that time for Alzheimer's, and a completely inhibited cytokine storm in this model. And when we tested it with molnupiravir, which is recently approved for COVID as a direct antiviral, we actually get a synergistic response with this drug. And importantly, based on part on these data, this drug, in fact, these data were included in a recent investigational new drug submission to the FDA by a company called Cantex to initiate phase two clinical trials. And I think this is a first for organs on chips. And I should note that, you know, we've also used this to discover new drugs. Uh, we have discovered short duplex immunostimulatory RNAs that, for example, induce potent interferon beta in both alveolar epithelium and, and, alve and airway epithelium. And this inhibits infection by H1N1 influenza, H3N2, SARS-CoV-2, MERS, and the common cold virus, at least in vitro. Uh, and uh, we are moving that in vivo. We're also funded by DARPA, NIH, and Open Philanthropy 
using molecular dynamic simulation as shown at the right. Uh, we've identified a conserved site in the spike protein that is responsible for large scale uh, opening up of the, of the protein to enable membrane fusion. And we now have oral inhibitors that, that inhibit SARS-CoV-2, uh, Omicron, BA1, BA2, and all other variants of concern, as well as other coronaviruses in the one to two micromolar, sometimes nanomolar range. And that has worked against native COVID-2 in a BSL-3 lab as well. So, and that's moving to animal studies as well. So this could be used for discovery as well. So those are just organ chips, uh, airway chips. We've also developed intestine chip. We originally started with uh, CACO2 intestinal epithelial cells, but we now also use, now we use human organoid derived epithelium. Organoids are fantastic, but they grow in a 3D matrix gel. Uh, and they're, they're very difficult to get to the lumen. You can't measure transport absorption, hard to do microbiome. We break them open into, ce into cells, put them on the chip. And now as shown at the bottom right, you get beautiful intestinal villi, you have endothelium on the other side, you can do these sorts of absorption transport studies. First thing we found is that um, we did transcriptomic analysis of organoids from duodenum versus the chips we made with those organoids versus in vivo duodenum. And across the entire transcriptome, we actually are getting closer to in vivo with the chips than the organoid. We've done this with duodenum. We've also done it with colon. This picture at the top right is a histological section through the chip, showing you the level of differentiation that mimics in vivo. Uh, at the top left, you don't get the, the differentiation of goblet cells that produce mucus in the organoids in the same medium or trans walls at the level you do with flow on the chip. And interestingly, we could visualize mucus accumulation and quantify it over time in living cultures by turning the chip on its side and using um, dark field imaging is what you're seeing here. And this is the mucus over three days. Uh, for the first time, we've been able to reconstitute the mucus bilayer structure seen in human colon, it's the same thickness. It has an in, inner in, in, impermeable layer where the bacteria microbiome can't get through that protects us and, a, and an outer permeable layer. Now, the most exciting part, I think, of the intestine chips is that, you know, the major paradigm shift in medicine over the last 15 years has been the microbiome. It's, you know, absolutely critical for health and disease, but you, it's very hard to grow microbes in contact with human cells because you get contamination. Organoids, maybe a day you can inject it into the lumen. But we've been able to create a hypoxia gradient across these chips by having oxygenated medium through the lumen of the endothelial channel. Uh, we, we have no oxygen at top. You get a gradient with enough oxygen for the human cells to survive. But there's literally less than 0.5% oxygen in the lumen of the intestinal channel, epithelial channel, because we have inline oxygen sensors, which is enough to maintain obligate anaerobes. And with this, we literally could take human stool samples and put them on chip and we maintain the same complexity over 200 different types of bacterial strains from 11 different genera for at least five days in contact with living human intestine. And, and the barrier is actually better. We just have a paper in BioArchives, we've done this in vagina and we've, we're doing it in other organs as well. At the, at the right, you see a video each of those little speckles, that's the density of bacteria in between the villi that, that we see on these chips and, and they're still healthy. And we have um, recently been, with Gates Foundation uh, funding, we've been modeling environmental enteric dysfunction, EED. This is malnutrition in, in low resource nations. We literally have organoids from healthy patients or from kids in Pakistan who have EED. And now we could study environmental contributions to this disease, such as malnutrition or dysbiosis, pathogen exposure, immune response, et cetera. And just an initial response, initial example, um, we can show that if, with healthy versus EED chips for, that we have reduced um, absorption of fatty acids shown here, also of proteins. If we give them nutritional deficiency by taking away nicotinamide and tryptophan, much more dramatic effect in the EED chip than healthy. But more interesting is that we had transcriptomics data from the patients in Pakistan with EED from whom the organoids were derived, shown here at the left. And now you can see that 
the, the only way we can begin to get close to mimicking this phenotype is with organoids from EED patients lining our chips and nutritional deficiency. So the environmental factor seems to be critical. If you just have nutritional deficiency with healthy, it doesn't look like that. If you just look at EED organoid based chips versus healthy, it doesn't look like that. So it really can see the environmental contribution here. Now, the other key goals that, um, that have been the focus of the field, the first is to predict human responses to drugs using clinically relevant dose exposures rather than bathing cells and drugs, to develop personalized disease models, to create models that replicate complex immune responses, and to replicate species-specific responses in vitro. Now, um, uh, first example is a, a human bone marrow chip that we developed a couple of years ago where we isolate CD34 cells from human marrow or blood. We put them into a matrix gel with bone marrow derived stromal cells uh, in one channel. And then we put endothelium in the other channel and perfuse only through the vascular channel. And with this, we get normal or near normal neutrophil maturation and erythroid maturation over 30 days as confirmed by flow cytometry. Uh, Geme sustain shows your range of different cells as you normally see in marrow. We retain much higher levels of CD34 progenitor cells than, for example, in suspension culture. Now, here we have um, tested a drug 5-fluorouracil, a cancer drug that has known marrow toxicity in patients, and it certainly has been shown to induce marrow toxicity in vitro in hematopoietic cell cultures before, but they use a high dose and they bathe the cells in it constantly under static conditions for like five days. And patients, they normally get a two day infusion at a concentration of about four micromolar. So when we perfuse these chips with four micromolar for two days, as shown by the highlighted bar here, we get a dose dependent inhibition, uh, a, a incre decrease in cell number or cell, cell death, if you like. And you do not see this under the same conditions, same dose, in static gels or, or suspension culture. And in the right, the different colored dots are basically different patient-derived bone marrow chips. So it shows you the robustness and reproducibility across six patients. Even more interesting, the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca came to us because they had a very unusual regimen-specific toxicity they observed in phase one clinical trials with a cancer drug called, um, called uh, AZD2811. Um, they saw neutropenia and anemia when they gave the same dose over two hours, whereas the same dose over 48, they only saw neutropenia. And they, they were having a hard time model this, modeling this in animals. So the nice thing is they had done mass spec on bloods from these, on plasma from patients, and the gray are the pharmacokinetic profiles, the drug exposure profiles of giving the drug in patients over two hours, goes up quickly and then comes down pretty quickly. Over 48 stays high, 48, and then drops a little bit more slowly. Um, we could mimic that drug exposure profile because we have flow. And the dots and solid line are the measurements by mass spec in our chips. Precisely mimicking the PK, we precisely mimic this toxicity. And it was not seen in suspension culture. Now, we also used this chip to develop personalized uh, model of a rare genetic disorder by getting cells uh, from patients, children who have a rare disease called schwachmann diamond syndrome, SDS, where you have decreased um, blood cell formation, which you can see even at low magnification across the whole chip, decreased cellularity. Quantifying it, we see decreased neutrophils, erythrocytes, CD34, decreased neutrophil maturity, and, and changes in erythroid maturity. What I'm not showing you though, is that we actually discovered that we identified a novel neutrophil maturation defect in these kids never seen before. And we went back and looked at eight patient donors and found that four of them have this defect and four do not. And so we're beginning to get insight into the etiology of this disease in ways that you couldn't otherwise. Now, just about a year ago, the cover of the New York Times Sunday section had this image and title, Future Vaccines Depend on Test Subjects and Short Supply Monkeys. And this is because non-human primates are, are the classic test bed for vaccines and many other drugs. And they literally are short in number because many centers are closing because of ethical region, reasons, but with COVID, it's gone out of control. And so wouldn't it be great if you could test vaccines in vitro 
on human uh, immune systems. And in fact, we have a paper that came out last week in advanced science. Uh, we developed a human lymphoid follicle chip. We literally just take peripheral blood, take B and T cells, concentrate them, put them in a matrix gel uh, in, in one uh, channel of the chip as shown at the left. We just superfuse through the other channel. If we give antigen, they spontaneously form germinal centers, uh, CTLA-4 expressing as well as AID expressing. You get plasma cell formation, CD138 positive staining cells. And now if you vaccinate with Fluzone, which is a commercial influenza vaccine you can get in a pharmacy, uh, you actually get antibody class switching and specific IgG, high affinity IgG against the hemagglutinin and antigen in the vaccine. In this case, we're using dendritic cells, add them into, this, into the germinal centers as well. Now, because we can collect the outflow from the vascular channel, we can measure cytokines as in patients. Now there's low concentration and low volume. So we have to use, um, lucky to have David Walt at the Visa Institute who developed Samoa, uh, which is a single molecule detection assay. And he happened to have data from patients who are vaccinated with flu vaccine. And you can see at the top left, the, 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 the rows um, match in red, the ones from our chips, the two at the right, that interferon gamma, IL-10, IL-2 are up, whereas these other cytokines are not. And we're now using this with collaboration with pharmaceutical companies and Gates. We've confirmed we could measure adjuvants and we're now testing and developing new vaccines using these chips. Now I mentioned species specific chips and, and this was because many years ago, um, two pharmaceutical companies, Janssen and AstraZeneca came to us and they said, can you make human, dog and rat liver chips? Because they have to do rat and dog preclinical studies on hepatotoxicity, drug-induced liver injury, DILI, um, for the FDA before they can go to clinical trials. And they almost always get conflicting results in dog and rat, as well as human cells and culture. So we, have we actually made human, dog, and rat chips, all with primary cells with four cell types, primary hepatocytes, primary liver sinusoidal endothelial cells, primary cupfer cells, and primary stellate cells in their right position. And with that, in the case here shown, Bozantin, um, you have very different response in human versus dog versus rat. And this paper was published a few years ago. We recapitulated not only hepatocellular injury, but steatosis, cholestasis, fibrosis uh, with multiple compounds. But what's more exciting, I think, is that, and this is in review right now, it's in bioarchive preprint, Emulate, which is a company I founded and I will disclose at the end, um, recently did studies with 780 human liver chips made from two different patient donors with all those four cell types. They tested a blinded set of 27 drugs that had known hepatotoxicity or non, no toxicity that were previously described in a publication by the pharmaceutical consortium, IQ consortium from multiple pharmaceutical companies, which is basically a benchmark saying if you could predict these toxicities better than animals, this could help validate replacing this particular animal model. And in that paper, we were able to predict human drug-induced liver injury with a sensitivity of 87% and a specificity of 100%. and was about seven or eight times better than animal models. And with this, uh, the, the FDA now has a, a route called iStand where you can apply to present data with the goal of replacing one animal model at a time and the process has started with these data. So to pull it together, we've developed you know, over 15 different chips and at the VIS Institute, other labs have developed more. But when I first presented this, I suggested because we have endothelium line channels, we could potentially create an integrated human body on chips. So you can imagine an oral drug going through the lumen of the gut chip, watch it be absorbed see it metabolized by the liver chip, peed out by the kidney chip. Do you have heart toxicity? What does it do to bone or aerosol drug through the lung chip? And we've now done this. We don't link by tubing. We link with a robotic liquid pipelines. But more importantly, we could do drop to drop passage from chip to chip. And every other drop we could, we could test for mass spec for drug levels or for cytokines. We could change the order of the linking very easily. And in this study, we kept gut, liver, kidney, heart, lung, blood-brain barrier, brain, skin, bone marrow, and pancreas chips 
alive on this automated instrument with imaging and feeding for a month. Uh, Kit Parker's group developed the heart and brain chips, and we're able to use a common blood substitute because we have this endothelium lining all the channels. But more importantly, we were funded by DARPA to do this with the goal of perhaps being able to predict quantitatively human drug pharmacokinetic parameters by combining measurements on chip of drug levels with computational uh, physiological PKPD analysis, pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic analysis. And we accomplished this by working with CFDRC, which is a company that does PKPD, um, pharma, computational PKPD for many pharmaceutical companies using clinical data. So they knew the, the masses of different organs, the blood flows, and we could scale our little chips to human organ level um, parameters. So in this study published a few years ago, we had two drugs. We did oral nicotine through the lumen of the gut chip measured by mass spec levels of it and its metabolites in every chamber as we connected flow. We have an arteriovenous reservoir so we could take samples from this like a peripheral blood sample rather than right after one of the organ chips, which would not make any sense. We also did intravenous cisplatin. Uh, we put it right into the AV reservoir, which did the mixing and then it went to the other chips. We didn't need the gut chip for the IV infusion, so we put a bone marrow chip so we could also measure pharmacodynamics. At the right, the colored dotted lines are the computational predictions from the same model that we used in both studies. Um, but based on the data, mass spec data of nicotine in the chips, this is what we predicted the PK would be. The dots and error bars are from a past clinical study published in Sweden for three forms of nicotine, oral nicotine. One is a gum and the other is chewing tobacco at three different doses, they call it snus. Um, and we precisely mimic the PK parameters. Similarly with cisplatin, two different infusion times, uh, we precisely, published study, we precisely mimic it. So we are able to predict quantitatively, at least in the study, two different drugs. And we also measured the PK, the pharmacodynamic effects of cisplatin toxicity and bone marrow in that study. So in summary, these two channel organ chips can faithfully recapitulate human pathophysiology. They mimic human responses to drugs and radiation, which I didn't show you using clinically relevant dose exposures. They quantitatively predict human drug PK parameters. And so we believe that they're really now in a position that they can replace some animal models in both research labs and the drug development pipeline. And so to end, I think this has really important implications for personalized medicine. Um, you know, the way most big pharma still work is they'll spend tens of millions on clinical trials, broad patient population usually fail. Then they'll do statistical number crunching. They'll search for a genetic subpopulation who might've responded a little better. If they're lucky, they find it. They do a narrow study and they get approved for a narrow application if everything goes well. With iPS cells, organoids, and primary cells from patients, you can make patient-specific chips, as I showed you. You could even make patient-specific whole body, integrated body on chips. You can model rare genetic disorders. You can do toxicity testing, which is hard to do clinically with lethal radiation or prenatal testing, very difficult to do a clinical trial. You can compare male versus female responses, pediatric versus adult, very hard to do pediatric trials. But you could also do this, you know, st study cohorts of di different genetic ancestries or similar comorbidities. You know, for example, Hispanic women who um, smoke cigarettes, who are ultra sensitive, you know, to have as asthmatic attacks. Can, can you make 50 chips from those women, find the optimal drug for lung effects on inflammation, minimal effects on liver toxicity, and use those 50 patients in a clinical trial? That would shorten the time, decrease the cost, increase the likelihood of success, and really, I think, transform the pharmaceutical industry. So with that, I have to tell you that I am a member of the board of directors. I chair the SAB and hold equity and emulate. Uh, at the left, 2010, that was what the chips looked like with tubes and pumps. At the right, you can now buy these instruments around the world that basically plug and play, no tubing, and they control the flow, the breathing motions, et cetera, and they fit into inc regular incubators. And so with that, I, I have to say that I could not do this without the incredible multidisciplinarity of the Wies Institute, where we have experts in everything. 
And I invite you to our website because there's so much more going on than Oregon Sun Chips. And the website itself has won multiple uh, Webby Awards, for example, and I think you will enjoy it. So thank you so much for this opportunity to share this with you. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, and uh, um, Apparently I am because uh, it's quite late in Boston, yeah. All right. My name is Uday Saxena and uh, I'm from the industry. Uh, I really enjoyed that presentation. It, it's a lot of the kind of work we have done and published, except we do 3D, we don't do Micro. uh, microchip. Because I, I think the throughput that is needed for the industry is not there in a chip, right? A chip is one experiment per chip. But in 3D, where we do 96 wells, I can get 96 data points. So, you know, so it's horses for courses. I'm not saying what they do is different or better or what not. But my key question is, um, looking far ahead, uh, if you want the US FDA to accept these in the absence of animal models, there's humongous challenges. All, everything that was described today and even what I do is what we call discovery. Discovery field is you can do what you like, there's no regulation. But in the industry, to use these tools by the regulators or by us uh, to, go, to make go-no-go -go decisions, should I let this drug go into humans and whatnot, there will be, have to be a lot of validation done. Retrospective validation, for example, if you have diabetes, take 20 diabetes drugs and demonstrate that in your model, they behave exactly like humans do. So I just want to alert people that there's two components of where this field is going to go. One is discovery, and very exciting what they were showed. The other is regulated products, which, is, which emulate is developing. That's a much harder task, and I think the FDA will probably deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. So I just want the audience to understand that there's two different aspects, and be very clear that just because you demonstrate something in the lab, the FDA is going to say, okay, don't do, go straight to phase two. That's not going to happen. So. Yeah, um, so you make uh, great points. So um, th that's exactly what's happening. So the liver work that Dr. Ingber's slides had. So it's literally assay, it's not even like case by case, it's literally assay by assay. Yep. So the FDA has put in place uh, pathways that if you think your um, model, be, whatever it is, can replace it, an assay that's currently done in animals, uh, it may be as simple as giving the animal uh, a challenge and doing uh, a serum ELISA, something as simplistic right. as that. Right. If you think your human organ chip can replace that, you have to do exactly that kind of val validation, yep. which of yep. course for microfluidic devices is uh, quite expensive. So as you yep. can imagine that uh, for emulate to do 800 chips from multiple donors is fairly <laughs> expensive. Uh, so yeah, but that pathway is in place and in particularly for things like orphan diseases or cancer immunotherapy. Yeah, totally. Where totally. uh, the, uh, modeling the human T cell repertoire or NK yeah. cells is extremely difficult. Uh, th there the pathway is much smoother because already many uh, cancer immunotherapies are approved without any animal data yeah. Yeah. because you, <clears throat> the animal data is more on toxicity and not on efficacy. Exactly. So that's another place where it has become. Reg regarding no, uh, so just to yeah. comment, I yeah. completely agree with you uh, on that. But the problem with rare diseases is most large pharma have very little interest. There's not enough money to be made, right? So, so rare disease is a great connect between 3D and actually getting into humans. Uh, but that, I think, uh, you know, large pharma in general would probably not be. But uh, you make a good point, yes. And then your second uh, or first comment was about throughput. Yeah, the, uh, our model is uh, pretty low throughput, the size of a normal incubator. We can run about 48 chips, and depending on the, that's 48 samples, right? So those samples may be coming from multiple donors or multiple conditions. So I would say in a f for 
for any one of the organ systems Dr. Ingber showed you, we can prop 48 chips is probably worth like two or three experiments if yeah. you're doing replicates, et cetera, yeah. uh, and controls. So it's currently very low throughput, but fr we haven't faced the throughput question very much from the FDA. They don't really care because in their mind, it's a replacement for an animal, which yes. is also low throughput. We face that question a lot from funding agencies and from pharma because mm -hmm. there they are trying to make a, they want a, a more predictive assay but with the power of 96 well plates. Yeah. And yep. that's where we, uh, yeah, we are sort of miniaturizing some aspects. We are also putting in a lot of built-in sensors. So yep. even if it's low throughput, you get a lot more information just like an animal from a single animal. Um, many other companies you all must be aware, like Mimitas mm -hmm. and things like that, they have mm -hmm. 96 well type of uh, systems that you can use. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, all I'm saying is, and every point you made is exactly, and I agree, it's called changing the town hall, right? Yeah, yeah. Changing the town hall is going to take 10 years. So you have to decide today whether you want to be the person to change the town hall, or do you want to, you know, focus on what you think is most bang for your buck. So that's the decision individually people exactly. will have to make. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's about the uh, lung on sheep model. So you have used blood uh, to as a source of immune cells. So uh, which cell is first traveling towards the uh, uh, infectious lung? Uh, because generally during the inflammation process, neutrophils are the one who which are recruited getting first. So. Uh, is it mimicking the like in vivo like conditions like first neutrophils are getting uh, recruited yeah. and then other so the data that was actually shown was with neutrophils you can also use other kinds of uh, immune cells in the lung we have uh, put alveolar macrophages we put t cells uh, but yeah, it really depends on the question the way uh, i look at it is it's a fit for, fit for purpose model there is no need to increase the complexity if your question doesn't require it. We can do whole blood, particularly when we're interested in things like complement, et cetera. But you really have to build your assays uh, such that you would be able to uncouple the multiple different things that are going on. And seeing from a biophysical perspective, uh, if, if uh, the chip or the mem porous membrane that is changing uh, its uh, uh, conformation, so during that change, if the pore size is changes, then the uh, infiltrating uh, immune cells, they will also face that uh, change in the pore size. Um, I don't think we've measured it, but the membrane is only like flexing about 5 to 15 percent. So my impression is because I've looked at it under the microscope a lot, the pores are not getting stretched that much. Uh, and the original pore size is anyway seven microns, which the immune cells very comfortably, even the larger ones like monocytes and neutrophils, will very comfortably cross through. So if, even if there's a 10-15% deformation happening in the pore size, I don't think it's contributing very much to the um, assay. Yeah. We, what we find is the uh, this inflammation status is more important. And uh, the immune cells that are, you are using, those are like autologous immune cells or? Uh... No, in those studies we have not used autologous uh, immune cells. What we have found is that even if you're working with T cells, and you can look at papers 30, 40 years back, even with HUVEC, right? At, at a normal uh, T cell density that you use in 2D, uh, 2D culture, you actually don't need to donor match. What ha does happen is there is a baseline level of activation, but there's no cytotoxicity. For the lymph node work where we, are, we have a packed tissue-like density, there we do need autologous cells, otherwise we, can't have, we get a very severe allograft rejection. But for most of our work, we don't need to. Uh, the other, uh, the reas reason we want to is not because of MH, uh, HLA uh, matching. It's more that if I have a chronic condition, then the best way to recapitulate that would be to have my blood cells, right? Uh, but that we find very hard to get, let's say, 
liver, parenchyma, liver endothelial cells, and sufficient amount of blood from the same patient. So we have not tried to donor match in most cases, if the exception of the lymph node. Thank you. Devashri from ICT Mumbai. I have a very basic question. So you have two models, with one with air-liquid interface and one with liquid-liquid interface. So I just wanted to understand how the cells, like how different do the cells act in both of the models? Like first layer is the epithelial, so. Yeah, it's quite dramatic in the lung. So in the lung you will not get, like other people have shown even in transfer, you cannot get complete maturation of the small airway. Uh, cells, particularly the formation of cilia at a liquid-liquid interface. And then if I were to infect this poorly matured uh, epithelium with the influenza virus or pseudomonas or something, uh, I would not get the same uh, accurate response either. So in the lung, it's quite dram dramatic. Other people have published from intestine transvals also that the way it's uh, the having an air-liquid interface can make a uh, huge impact on the mucus production. In the intestine, we continue to use liquid-liquid because we want the sort of uh, microbiota to be perfused out um, periodically. Um, yeah, but it makes a huge impact. So I would definitely, if you're thinking of an assay, validate it in, and choose your path early on because it will change. Whether, depending on whether you've used uh, air liquid or a liquid liquid. Thank you. I'm sorry. We'll have to cut short with the questions. I remind you, please keep your questions very short. You have plenty of time to interact with Dr. Goel now in the break, as well as later during her talk. And if you don't find her, please catch her at lunch or dinner times. She's here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll now break for a small tea. We'll rejoin at 11.30.